What are your hobbies? There's a vast range to choose from. A lot of people like sport and fitness as an escape from the working world. Today, there's a movement to get ordinary people involved in doing science as a hobby. All kinds of strong science can be done by amateurs across many different subject areas. In some respects, it mirrors the Victorian era, where almost all valuable scientific research was done by lay rather than professional scientists. <laughs> in fact, professional scientists were very few and far between. The Reverend Daniel Dutton was one such amateur. Dutton was born into a family with strong links to the primitive Methodist church in Staffordshire, England. At the age of 14, he underwent the primary test of membership in that denomination. This was publicly witnessing to the experience of trusting in God and God alone for his salvation. That's about as close as it gets to what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, would have wanted to see happening. As a young man, Dutton trained as a mining engineer. This increased his early thirst for scientific knowledge. However, at the age of 20, he candidated for the ministry and then spent the next four years studying the theological disciplines. Ordained in 1872, his intellectual talent was quickly recognised and he was appointed to important circuits. But here's the point. Dutton didn't let circuit duties interfere with his thirst for science. There's the classic mistake clergy of every theological persuasion make. Doesn't matter what denomination they owe allegiance to, but all too quickly, church duties replace passions, hobbies and interests. They fossilise. In 1876, Dutton was made a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society always making time, quote, during those busy years to keep up his scientific reading, unquote. That was under the direction of a professional astronomer. He contributed steadily to a variety of scientific journals in the next few years, and in 1880 was elected a fellow of the Royal Geological Society. But between those two honours, Dutton had emigrated to New Zealand. Now, this was in response to an urgent need for competent ministers in the rapidly expanding colony. His original intention was to serve overseas for seven years and then return home. Dutton soon found that the New Zealand Primitive Methodist Church stationed its ministers even more frequently than the Wesleyans. He was moved by stages from Auckland to Wellington to Invercargill, that's the length of the country, over a period of some six years. Like Fitchett, he grew weary of the disruption to his family life because of the frequency of shifts. And so he resigned. This was a great loss, theologically, to the primitive Methodists, because none of the other ministers could even approach Dutton's level of scientific awareness. Now, Dutton's shift was sideways. He didn't return to England. Instead, he went from primitive Methodist to Presbyterian. A.R. Fitchett sought refuge with the Anglicans of Dunedin. Dutton found his way to the Prezies. If anyone, lay or ordained, was looking for an exciting church place to belong, it was the Presbyterians in Dunedin during the second half of the 19th century. It was a hotbed of theological insight and church fighting. Anyway, an opportunity arose for Dutton to do a short assistantship at First Church Dunedin, followed by a supply at St Andrews in Dunedin. There he stood in for Rutherford Wardell, who had been granted an extended leave to Great Britain. We will look at Reverend Dr Rutherford Wardell's influence later and through the year with John Wesley. It speaks volumes that these Presbyterian parishes at the time would take in a primitive Methodist. Dutton proved acceptable. In January 1886, the Synod of Otago Southland formally processed his application for recognition as a Presbyterian minister. Some raised an objection about his request on theological grounds. Weren't Methodist believers in the Arminian system of salvation? Wasn't that opposed to Calvinism? Perhaps this questioning was a forewarning of what was to flare 
into the Professor Salmond heresy trial in the presbytery later that year. Church, university, and various civic groups would become entangled. Tensions would rise to white hot. But that's another story. At this time, the Reverend James Gibb spoke on Dutton's behalf, noting that besides his disenchantment with the itinerant ministry of Methodism, there were other factors. These included, quote, Dutton's natural affinity, unquote, for the Presbyterian ethos. Salmond also made the point that the Presbyterian Church would benefit immensely. Those who had the sense of evangelistic fervor, often associated with Methodism, would be a valuable addition. Once accepted, Dutton served the Presbyterian Church with great zeal and energy in a variety of roles. His first and only calling was to Caversham Parish. There he remained for the next 31 years until retirement. And during that long productive tenure, he was appointed as the first New Zealand Army chaplain, being posted during the Boer War. Then in 1914, when he was 66 years old, he was again appointed a chaplain to the soldiers. This posting was due to an extraordinary public campaign of popular acclaim to send him to minister to the soldiers. The government allowed Dutton to travel on a troop ship to Cairo, but that was all. No further. 1921, Dutton was elected moderator of the General Assembly. It was a personal triumph for the refugee from primitive Methodism. It was said then that during the years of his ministry, he had given unstinting service to many congregations through lecturing on, quote, scientific subjects, especially on astronomy, unquote. Yet despite his delight in science, Dutton grew weary of it in later life. He understood the dangers of scientism, just as he understood the same dangers of religious fundamentalism. In fact, the word fundamentalism was coined and gained traction during the first two decades of the 20th century. Dutton and Fitchett fled Methodism into different denominations. They had their practical and their theological reasons. Little changed in the Methodist camp as, down the decades, it displayed ruthless qualities in its rigid belief of an itinerant ministry. And one symptom among many, it all wasn't well. Join me next week as we see how important it was to pass on the science as well as faith for many of these clergy. And thanks for watching.